I sit at my desk, masking my daydreaming by typing randomly into a PowerPoint document. Type, 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 furious clicking, delete my blah, blah, blahs, and lean into the screen while scowling purposefully. It seems to satisfy my boss, though I know I will have to produce something eventually. The days of water cooler sports talk and cafeteria tuna melts are upon me. Trying to pass the time, I have resolved to photograph every sunrise and sunset, eat tacos every day, and put my feet in the ocean at every available opportunity. Still, I can't help but feel shamed, and I joke constantly about chewing my own hand off to escape my desk. I can't take it, I whined to Sarah on my lunch break. I'm not a domesticated animal. Blair, you are one of the most skilled people I have ever met when it comes to doing whatever the fuck you want all the time. And you know what? Sometimes you need to shut up and pay the piper. Well, that bitch having proved useless, <laughs> I call shame. I hate that you have to do this, honey. I'm thinking of you stuck out there. It's just not you. I hate it. When are you coming home, dipshit? He was most likely on his way to live his half of our day drinking, night working life that we stumble through when I'm home. I don't know, I sigh. The contract ends in May, but oh, there's so many balls in the air. I don't know, I don't know when I'll be back. <laughs> back in our white walled, fluorescent lit office, my coworkers click on and type actual things. They are a dedicated, productive set of people. In private conversation, most of them confess to being absolutely fucking miserable. If I had to do it over, Mark tells me, I wouldn't have gotten married. I, I love my wife, but I really should have stayed single. It's just, you know, what I was supposed to do. And now it's kids and mortgage payments and, well, you know, heck, I can't even get away to see a movie. He was a timid, balding Asian guy in his early 30s with three kids under the age of five, one of whom was special needs. I just wanted to see The Hobbit. <laughs> the Mexican cafeteria guy whose name I can't recall has four kids and says that though he too has love for his wife, he plans to divorce her upon the youngest child's high school graduation. I'll give her the house, he says, but I just need to go do what I want to do finally. My boss, my boss, who I stayed with for the first six weeks of this gig, races home every day after work to his case of corona, sits on the couch drinking and watching reality TV, getting up only to walk his wife's shih tzu. Usually around 10.30 he would get up, say something vaguely creepy to me, go throw up in the bathroom and stumble to bed. Three of his four kids from his first marriage won't speak to him, though I have not managed to get him to say why. Might have something to do with my drinking, he said. I recall thinking that if you're going to drink yourself out of a family, you should be on something better than Corona. <laughs> Whatever, man. I am the company wild card. I'm a freelancer, the only female, the only non-engineer on my team. I'm under 30, I'm covered in tattoos, I swear freely. They listen wrapped at my stories from the road when I'm in the mood to tell them. They bore me to tears. If I were smart, I would take this as a permanent gig. The money is right. I'm shoveling through mountains of debt that I accrued in the months after my last breakup. I'll soon be able to start putting money in savings. The weather's perfect. The rent is cheap in my Hollywood apartment and outside the drab confines of the office, people are more or less fuckable. I bet I can find a little dive bar and a little scene and some little LA doppelgangers of all my favorite New Yorkers. Despite being kind of jaded, I'm a pretty happy person, and who can hate the eternal summer of Southern California? But I was not going to be smart. This was not going to be the first time. Your career won't keep your feet warm when you're old, my grandmother had advised 18 months prior. She was growing visibly weary of my obstinance after spending several months aggressively encouraging me to take my now ex up on his offer to move to Georgia where I would supposedly live happily and barefoot ever after as a cop's wife. I lit a cigarette and adopted a defensive pose. With all due respect, I said, your husband didn't keep your feet warm in old age. He died. She put her head in her hands and let loose a defeated groan. I just want you to be happy and taken care of. I suspect those things <clears throat> may be mutually exclusive. <laughs> 
My favorite commute activity, and there was always plenty of time on my commute, is to list all the things I hate about LA. Because, you know, why try harder to adjust? The traffic, car culture, urban sprawl, the way everyone is trying to do something without ever really doing anything. The sun, yeah, I said it, fuck the sun. I feel like I'm walking underwater on Valiant out here with all this fucking sunshine. <laughs> See, the thing is, when you're really crazy about something or someone, it doesn't even phase you that they're terrible with money or chew with their mouth open, right? I'm the person who can forgive New York City of all its most grievous faults. What it boils down to is, I'm too much of a masochist to be happy in Southern California. I think a part of me needs to be in constant danger of starvation, bankruptcy, or arrest. I've never thought of myself as an adrenaline junkie, but I'm just restless. <laughs> this characteristic has not lessened with age as many predicted and probably hoped. The months I have here will not kill me, and if I play my cards right, I won't have to do anything this drastic for a long time. In the meantime, I try to experience the normalcy around me through the David Lynch filter in my brain. <laughs> Maybe I should start taking LSD before work. <laughs> this one is called uh, The Seven Year Itch or What the Hell is Love Part Two. <laughs> I don't believe in love at first sight. Love tends to creep up on me, probably because I've always considered it to be a distraction, something that siphons your creative energy away. And so I'm never looking for it, and I am in fact extraordinarily cagey and usually actively avoiding it. I'm conquest driven. I lust, I triumph, I move on. Not cold, just aloof. It's rare for love to get the better of me. When it does happen, I regard it as a defeat. Such is my relationship with New York City. We met in 2009. <laughs> I lusted, full of early 20s bravado. I spent a summer letting the city woo me, sweating and smoking blissfully on my best friend's fire escape up in Inwood, dropping acid at warehouse parties in, in a bushwick that was just a little less sanitized than it is now. And in the fall, adequately fascinated by the possibilities, I lunged left Seattle with triumph in mind. Predictably to everyone but me, the city conquered me with brutal force. I was fucked into a quivering heap, disoriented and craving. Like all the times I'd met my match in men, the city laughed and had a smoke before coming at me again. In love was shoved down my throat before I even knew what was happening. New York has virtually no refractory period. It's fucking glorious. I dedicated myself to the city, knowing full well I was in over my head, and realizing over time I was only one of millions who'd been conquered the same way. But I'm stubborn and uh, extremely susceptible to Stockholm Syndrome, so I stayed. Those early days of summer romance and charmingly quintessential creative youthful poverty gave way to the missteps of someone a little older, but not much wiser. I remember this one time, still up, still real jumpy from shitty coke, I laid anxiety riddled on the floor of my dingy Chinaman, Chinatown tenement apartment and wrote, I've been wondering, when do I get to look back fondly on these lean years? <laughs> Seems like they've carried on for a while. <laughs> Friends back home say you're used to it. You always figure it out. I am. I do. Been walking the tightrope a long time. I know I'm still young, but lately my teeth have been hurting and my eyes, my livelihood, need help. I'm always one canceled gig away from homeless. I won't lie, I have my fun, but the truth is I'm a slave to the junkiness, highs, and lows of this place, and I can't live any other way. One of these days, my luck's gonna run out, and I'll wish I'd stayed in that little town and let someone put a baby in me, or whatever it is they do out there. <laughs> but then, I met Shane. Shane was a magnificently loving, safe, talented, 
misogynistic, occasionally violent, hilariously and heartbreakingly bleak, difficult man who saw something in me that inspired him to lift me up from the squalor I'd fallen into and introduce me properly to the East Village, and Philip, where I learned how to be a cynical derelict who could still keep a job. <laughs> <laughs> With his encouragement and introductions, I made pioneering professional strides. He grew me up with his gruffness, his realism, and his unwavering old-school moral code. He and my new comrades gave me the next and to date best two years of my life. I never belonged to someone so completely or loved anybody so fiercely. Years ago, desperately homesick on a West Coast gig I'd taken out of financial necessity, I had naively described myself as a person who could forgive New York City the most grievous of its faults. Now I'm eating my words, because Shane died very suddenly back in August. I'm not really ready to write about it yet. <clears throat> but I spent the last several months navigating how to forgive New York City for this. I mean, forget broke, forget strung out, heart sick. This was unprecedented betrayal. I'm thinking maybe, uh, maybe it's not healthy for me to just forgive. Maybe for once I should value my love at something other than willingness to suffer and just fucking leave. I used to joke with Shane that should he ever dump me, I would move to New Orleans, a city I had long flirted with. Went down there for Mardi Gras this year, it butted up <clears throat> right against the six-month anniversary of his death, which was Valentine's Day. Thanks, asshole. Uh, <laughs> and I needed a vacation, and anyway, the place was real good to me. Within days, I had work, new friends on the service industry scene, all the harmless debauchery I could handle. It was like being told, you earned this. Come on, baby, have some more etouffee. <laughs> My last day in the Crescent City, I took down numbers for realtors. I did a lot of thinking on the 20-hour drive back, and I rented something a couple weeks later, figuring I'd sort out the logistics later. But of course, same as all my shitbag exes psychically sensing me finally deleting their phone numbers, the minute I rolled back into town, New York started showering me with affection. <laughs> that fucking guy, right? <laughs> I started making all these memories out in Brooklyn. <clears throat> Found some friends in the bars I've been working in out there. Younger archetypes of my East Village drunks. Started fucking one of them, that's been fun. <laughs> Reincarnation of every dirtbag I ever cared about. Though this one drinks tequila, so it could totally end differently, right? right? <laughs> well, maybe not. <laughs> maybe it's because my parents are still together. 25 years and all manner of trial and tribulations later, but I've never been able to stop loving once I finally let myself start. Never dumped anyone. Actually, that's that's not entirely true. Uh, the only person I ever dumped is in the audience tonight. Hi, Lex. <laughs> but no, really, my MO is not to dump, it's to cheat until I get kicked to the curb. That's kind of my thing. Um, but I do, I, I believe in commitment, and I believe that you can't truly for love something until you've had to forgive it. So, um, I don't know who I'm kidding, because I'm, I'm, not, I'm not fucking going anywhere. And anyway, I, I'd have to, write a, have to write one of those stupid goodbye to all that essays, and I hate those. <laughs>